Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crohn's and Colitis Canada's COVID-19 and IBD webinar. This webinar is being offered in both English and French. To listen in French, please select the interpretation button found in the webinar control panel. If you experience any technical problems during the webinar, please try refreshing your website browser or relaunching the webinar. You can contact us using the Q&A box found in the webinar control panel, or you can email us at learn at This webinar is being recorded and a link to the video will be sent to your email and posted to our website tomorrow evening. French subtitles will be available the following week. You can access all of our webinar videos at www.cronesandcolitis.ca slash COVID webinars. If you'd like to ask a question for the Q&A period later on, please comment in the Q&A box found in the webinar menu bar. We cannot answer questions about specific medical situations. You can get more answers about COVID-19 vaccines at www.cronesandcolitis.ca slash COVID vaccines. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Crohn's and Colitis Canada's President and CEO, Lori Radke. Hi everyone, I'm Lori. Uh, hope you all had a wonderful summer and enjoyed a nice Labor Day weekend. And I guess I would say it's with mixed feelings that I welcome you back to our COVID-19 programming. Mixed in that we would all love to be able to put COVID-19 behind us once and for all, but we can't, not just yet. Um, until that happens, we promised that we would continue to provide you with the latest guidance and to be here to answer the questions that are on your mind. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you to join me in congratulating our 2021 AbbVie IBD scholarship recipients. It was our 10th year of scholarships and in celebration of our anniversary, we doubled the number of recipients this year from 10 to 20. Each of these 20 recipients who live with Crohn's or colitis were awarded with a $5,000 scholarship as they head back to class at a Canadian post-secondary institution. We are very proud to be able to help these inspirational students from across Canada in fulfilling their academic journey. Congratulations to each of them. And as the days get shorter and cooler, we can't help but wonder what's ahead. There are new questions for us to discuss, such as variants, booster shots, and the continued importance of vaccination. As an organization, we at Crohn's and Colitis Canada feel strongly that immunization against COVID-19 is everyone's responsibility, and we must do everything possible to protect our community. Vaccines have proven to be effective in preventing severe COVID-19, even against the variants of concern. As such, our organization is in the process of implementing our own policy that will require our employees to be vaccinated. We hope that many workplaces, organizations, and schools do the same, as vaccinations help to minimize the risk of serious and deadly COVID-19 for those living with Crohn's or colitis. As always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. Tonight is our 27th webinar. And as I said earlier, we remain committed to hosting these webinars as long as you need us to. Alongside these COVID-19 and IBD webinars, we'll also be holding some topical webinars. We hope you can join us for our gutsy learning series, and our young adult series this fall. Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's and Colitis and to improve the quality of, quality of life of children and all adults affected by these chronic diseases. As always, please watch for our emails and along with our at Get Gutsy Canada social media for updates. With that, a huge thanks to our task force who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. And thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Abdu Sharkawi and Dr. Parakal Deepak. Thank you also to BG Communications and Mike the Interpreter for providing live French language interpretation. <laughs> 
Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Benjamal are our moderators again tonight. Please welcome Dr. Gil Kaplan, Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary, adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist, past chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council. And Dr. Eric Benchmal, Professor and Pediatric Gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, Chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council, and as well as a Crohn's and Colitis Canada Board Director. Thank you and our very best to you and your families at this time. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you so much, Laurie. Well, we're back. Gil, even though we said we probably wouldn't need to be back. Um, you know, I think we're all glad that we can provide this service to all of you. There are lots of people watching uh, from your home. And, uh, but I think we're disappointed that the pandemic is not over and that we're not facing down a fourth wave right now. But uh, I think we have some new information to share with everybody in terms of the third vaccine dose and vaccine effectiveness. Lots has come out over the past few months. So I think that uh, at least we'll be able to provide you with some education and some guide guidance to uh, know how to deal with this fourth wave. Yeah, absolutely. And as Laurie mentioned too, you know, Eric and I, the entire task force, uh, and really the IBD community across Canada is going to be here throughout the fall, the winter, and however long it takes to provide additional information to help kind of guide you, the audience, as well as your, your physicians and healthcare providers uh, on, on how to manage the nuances of this pandemic as, as it evolves. Uh, and I think today we actually have a really exceptional webinar. Um, Eric and I are actually going to do two talks that kind of complement and move into each other, uh, and then that, then transition to invite two uh, internationally re renowned um, uh, specialists to talk about um, uh, the Delta uh, variant, the booster vaccines, um, and, and how this is implicating um, you, the, the IBD community. Yeah, I hope uh, it becomes very informative for everybody. And wishing everybody in the audience who's Jewish uh, Shana Tava. Yesterday was the second day of Rosh Hashanah, so Shana Tava Gil and everybody in the audience who celebrates. So most people will be familiar with, with this slide. Um, as of September 9th, uh, 2021, over 220 million people have been diagnosed with COVID, over 1.5 million in Canada alone. Um, the Secure IBD Registry and International Database of Individuals with IBD who've tested positive for COVID. Today, there's over 6,500 individuals who have been reported into that database. Um, this figure shows us the daily number of cases of COVID diagnosed over the past 18 months in Canada. Uh, today, we can clearly see four waves of the pandemic. The largest wave was in the spring of 2021, followed by a lull in the summer, driven largely by the Delta variant, the unvaccinated, and relaxation of public health measures. We are now in the midst of the fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we watch the fourth wave unfold, the question on all of our minds is, when is this all going to stop? Is COVID-19 here to stay? Will SARS-CoV-2 become endemic in society, meaning that it will continue to circulate in pockets of the global population for years to come? The ideal scenario will be a vaccine like we have for polio and measles. These are graphs from the website, Our World and Data. They show the reported cases of polio and measles before and after the vaccine was introduced. In 1979, polio was eradicated in North America while measles outbreaks have been reported from time to time. And in fact, a second booster dose was successful in causing cases to plummet. However, measles is not entirely eradicated as localized resistance to the measles vaccine has resulted in small pockets of disease resurgence. So will our COVID-19 vaccines follow the same pattern as measles or will they become more like influenza where scientists need to engineer a new vaccine every year? Uh, the flowchart I'm about to show you illustrates the different scenarios that may play out in the future that depend on the properties of the virus, the effectiveness of the vaccine, and whether most of society is vaccinated or not. So the first question is, does immunity last? Another way to say this, does immunity from vaccines or infections wane over time? If immunity wanes, we're going to need booster shots for COVID-19. But even if immunity lasts, the next question is, will the virus evolve beyond vaccine immunity? Will variants allow the virus to escape the immune system? If so, the vaccines will need to be reformulated regularly, like the influenza vaccine. 
The next question we ask is whether the vaccines can block transmission from one person to the next. If the answer is yes, we ask whether we can achieve herd immunity in the population, either by the vaccine or natural infections or obviously a combination of the two. If yes, then the vaccines will act similar to measles where it's eliminated in regions with herd immunity and occurs in regions without. However, if we can't achieve that herd immunity or the vaccine doesn't effectively block transmission, the virus will become endemic in society, similar to other common viruses. In this scenario, the most important question is whether the vaccine can prevent severe illness. If yes, the virus is endemic, but like the common cold, but if not, then we're gonna have endemic COVID-19 with severe illness in society with wave of infection following wave. So the first question I wanna tackle is, can vaccines prevent severe illness? So I wanna share data with you from Seattle and King County who published an interactive online dashboard that compares COVID-19 outcomes between individuals who are vaccinated versus those who are not fully vaccinated. The link for the dashboard and a QR code is displayed on this slide to allow you to explore the data for yourself. Uh, since January 17, 2021, when vaccines became widely available for those living in the U.S., nearly 60,000 individuals were diagnosed with COVID-19 in King County, 87% of the diagnosis in individuals who were not fully vaccinated. Those not fully vaccinated were four times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, no vaccine is 100% effective, and we do see evidence of breakthrough infections after completing the vaccine series. But how effective are COVID-19 vaccines in preventing serious illness, including hospitalization and death? Here's the data showing after adjusting for age, individuals with COVID-19 who are not fully vaccinated were 16 times more likely to be hospitalized and 21 times more likely to die when compared to fully vaccinated individuals. In fact, if we look at what's happening over the past nine months, the picture becomes clear. This is a figure showing age-adjusted COVID-19 rates over time. In, in King County. Um, the overall rate is displayed by the orange line with the blue line demonstrating those not fully vaccinated having much higher rates of infection as compared to the gray line representing fully vaccinated individuals. The separation is most dramatic in August where the predominant SARS-CoV-2 strain was the Delta variant. This data is similar to what we're seeing in Canada and what's being published in medical journals uh, internationally. So the choice to not be vaccinated is simply not a personal decision of, on your own risk, but it has dire consequences to society as a whole. The choice we make are fundamental in answering this key question. Can we achieve herd immunity in society? I just wanna end my part of the talk by reviewing some of, the, some of the key factors that influence whether we can achieve herd immunity and ultimately be rid of these waves of COVID-19. The first factor is whether vaccines can prevent transmission. While vaccines are highly effective at preventing symptomatic and severe COVID-19, we are seeing evidence of breakthrough infections among those who are fully vaccinated. Consequently, the Swiss cheese model is still relevant today as no single intervention is perfect at preventing the spread of infection. The second factor is the rise of variants like Delta. This figure demonstrates the Delta variant is outcompeting other versions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, mainly because it's, highly, it's much more highly infectious. New variants of SARS-CoV-2, such as Delta, are sprouting up and that might be more transmissible and potentially more resistant to vaccines down the road. Now, COVID-19 is a global disease that requires a global strategy for vaccination. The longer it takes to stem the transmission of the virus, the more time that these variants have to emerge and spread. Lagging vaccine programs can lead to a selective evolutionary process that favors the formation of new variants. Today, we are seeing disparity of distribution of vaccine between countries and even within countries. And as we've seen in different parts of, of the country in Canada, vaccine penetration society increases, people start to revert to pre-pandemic behavior and governments start to lift public health mandates like masking. But if these actions are taken too quickly before the majority of the population is fully vaccinated, we will not achieve herd immunity and continue to experience wave after wave of COVID-19. And finally, immunity likely will not last forever. We need to understand how long vaccine-based immunity lasts and whether boosters are necessary over time. We also need to understand if some individuals are at high risk of their antibodies waning over time. 
This is a graph from IBD Clarity Study. At this point, I want to bring Eric into the discussion to present on antibody levels to the vaccines and those with IBD, and also to talk about CCC's recommendations regarding booster shots. Thanks very much, Gil. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here. Just start presenting. There we go. So this is really an update. Uh, you know, the last time we updated on vaccines in COVID-19 was really back in April, I believe, May potentially. And so I wanted to give you an overall update as to what's happening with vaccines uh, around the world. And as Gil mentioned, this is sort of the number of doses administered per 100 people around the world. You can see what, what Gil was implying, uh, this huge disparity across countries, but that Canada in general is amongst the most vaccinated countries in the world. This is the rate of vaccines uh, given uh, per 100 people over time. I just wanted to point out that Israel sort of started off very early and then instituted a booster program where they gave third doses, and now they're at third doses to most of the population. And so that's why it sort of went up. But let's focus on Canada here. And I think this is what has a lot of people concerned is although there was a great deal of enthusiasm for the vaccines at the beginning, uh, or when we, they became available rather in Canada, which was rather late, but uh, you know we wanted it. Now the number of people being vaccinated is waning. And unfortunately we're not at 100% of the popul eligible population, people over 12 years old, having been fully vaccinated. We're doing okay. We've got about 60% of the overall population uh, in Canada, fully vaccinated and 74% with one dose. Uh, with, however, you know, there's still a long way to go. Uh, we still have a good 10 or 20% of adults in Canada who are not vaccinated. And that's why you're starting to see new public health measures coming in place to more strongly encourage vaccinations uh, in the unvaccinated population, things like uh, vaccine certification, proof of vaccinations, and mandatory vaccine policies by employers. So let's talk a little bit about vaccination in immunocompromised people. This is a slide from the uh, American Committee on Immunizations uh, back in July, but I think it still very much applies now. Uh, and you can see that the overall percent of people with an adequate antibody response uh, after two mRNA vaccines, so that's the Pfizer BioNTech or the Moderna vaccine, varied widely based on conditions, underlying conditions you may have. Whereas 95 to 100% of people, of healthy people, had good immunization response after two vaccines, certainly people with cancer organ transplant, people on immunosuppressive therapies, as well as people with hemodialysis fell below that mark in terms of antibody response. Now, you may remember back in April, we had Dr. Pham Hui on to tell us that really antibody response is not the whole story when it comes to vaccine response. However, since then, there have been a number of publications in healthy controls, and then I'll show you one in IVD patients, that shows that antibody response does seem to correlate very well with T cell immunity, which is the other type of immunity that Dr. Pham Hui spoke about when she presented back in April. So this is a look at the medications that people might be on uh, and the rate of vaccine response in IBD patients. You remember this is from Clarity IBD presented by Charlie Lees in April again at that same webinar. So I urge you to go back and watch that webinar. It was very useful and still applies today. But you can see that these are IBD patients who are enrolled in the Clarity IBD study. They either were on infliximab, uh, which trade name Remicade, Renflexis, and others, or uh, they were on vetalizumab, which is trade name Entivio, and they compared those two groups to see what their response rates were. But they also looked at what other medications that they could be on, and you can see that response rates on 5-ASA medicines, which are not immunosuppressing, were very good lower with azathioprine, lower with anti-TNF biologics, and lower with combined therapy of azathioprine and anti-TNF biologics. So it was a very important study to tell us that really uh, there is something going on with impaired vaccine response when it comes to use of these medications in, um, in our IBD population. And this was also presented by Dr. Lees back in April, looking at what was the actual quantitative, the number of antibodies produced by people who were on either infliximab or adalimumab, comparing the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine to the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine, the adenovirus vector vaccine. And you can see that 
people on vetalizumab or Intivio who are not on a biologic that systemically suppresses their immune system, they mounted very good response and the majority of them had more than 15 units uh, of antibodies after one dose, this is one dose of vaccine. Whereas people on infliximab, which systemically suppresses your immune system, had a much worse response. And in fact, a good number had no antibodies after one dose to either of these vaccines. And antibody level again is thought to increase protection. So the higher your antibodies, the more protected you are against infection and potentially also severe infection, hospitalization and ICU admission. So I wanna focus on this paper preprint publication that has come out from the same study, the Clarity IBD study, looking at antibody response over time and whether the antibodies sort of go away with time after your second vaccine dose. It's worth mentioning that this study is in preprint only. It has not been fully peer reviewed. I checked with Dr. Lees this morning actually, and it's still under review at a journal. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. It hasn't been fully pre, uh, peer reviewed, but I think it, it's a very well done study and it shows some very, very important findings. The first is what Gil implied earlier uh, was that there seems to be a waning antibody response after the second dose. So on the left again is the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and on the right is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So I'll focus really on the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Very clearly a waning response in people who are on infliximab, the green line, versus people who are on vetalizumab, which does not systemically suppress your immune system. The same is happening to, to in the AstraZeneca vaccine as well. However, in people at the bottom here who had an infection plus got two doses of vaccine, so in some ways they got three doses of antigen, right? They got three doses of exposure to something that would stimulate their immune system. The antibody response did not wane over time whether you were on infliximab or vetalizumab. You know, infliximab patients were slightly lower, but they still maintain very good antibody levels after the second vaccine. So that tells that, that potentially, you know, a third exposure, which for most people in Canada, because they haven't had an infection, would be a third vaccine dose, may actually help you sustain your antibody levels for longer but this is not a study of a third vaccine dose. They did not have anybody in it that had a third vaccine dose. This is a different way of looking at it. And it's looking at the proportion of patients with adequate antibodies with an antibody response. And you can see again, the green patients on infliximab had a much quicker waning of their antibodies than people on vetalizumab, both for the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines. And then in this study, actually, they were able to bring in a control group of a healthy community cohort from another study and compare antibodies to that group to the ones on infliximab and vetalizumab. And it looks like generally that for both types of vaccines, patients on vetalizumab had a very similar antibody response to the community control group, the community cohort, whereas patients on infliximab had a lower antibody response and it waned more quickly. Remembering that Antibodies are not the whole story. T cell immunity is important as well. They looked at whether the antibody levels correlated with your likelihood of mounting a T cell immune response. And they found that yes, that was the case for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Not so much, there wasn't good correlation with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, but other studies have correlated T cell response to the antibodies in AstraZeneca. So that tells us that antibodies are a pretty good measure of T cell immunity as well in our IBD population. I wanted to bring up what other factors might uh, result in a waning of antibody response. So your antibodies dropping over time more quickly. So as we mentioned, so anything on the left of this line implies that you're more likely to drop your antibodies quickly. Anything on the right of this line means you're less likely to drop your antibodies quickly. quickly. So we know that infliximab made you uh, really around 80% more likely to drop your antibodies quickly. Being on a thiopurine, so azathioprine or 6 mercaptocopurine was also associated with a quicker drop in your antibodies. Being on methotrexate, having Crohn's as opposed to having ulcerative colitis, uh, being older, and we've seen that in other studies, not in IBD patients, but being older, you're more likely to lose your antibody response. Uh, Non-white ethnicity, you were less likely to lose your antibody response. You had better antibodies to begin with. And that may be a function in the UK of 
uh, people being infected. They were more likely to be non-white ethnicity. They got COVID along the way. So that may be part of that. And then being a smoker, you were more likely to lose your antibody response uh, over time. This is from a different IBD study from the Prevent COVID study, uh, which is run by Mag Kaffelman, and it's an American study, multi multiple centers in the US. And they looked at your median anti-spike antibody, your COVID antibody titer, eight weeks after your second dose and what medications you were on. So overall, your response was about 17. Now, don't compare this to the 15 number from Clarity IBD. It may be a completely different assay, and so you might not be able to compare. But that's sort of the number overall. But you can see that being on an anti-TNF, which are medicines like infliximab and adalimumab, those, uh, and golimumab as well, and sertilizumab, those medicines were associated with the lowest antibody response eight weeks after your second dose. But being on a, a thiopurine and methotrexate, it was slightly lower. Being on 5-ASA or no medicines, you were at a slightly higher than average antibody response. Being on vetalizumab, seems not to have affected your antibody response. And being on ustekinumab, which is the trade name Stellara, seemed not in this study to affect your antibody response, but the sample size was small, so it's hard to know for sure. I want to bring up this idea, and this was brought up at the ASEP meeting at the end of August, and I think it's important, is that there's two potential uses for a third dose of the COVID vaccine, or for any vaccine. The first is as, as an additional dose to your primary vaccine series, meaning that there may be some people in our population that just need a third dose. It's not really a booster. It's getting you the same immunity that everybody else in the population would have. And I think we're, we're pretty much at the stage where we're establishing that likelihood is that people who are immunosuppressed, transplant patients, people on systemic immunosuppression, they really need that third dose because they're not mounting a good response to begin with. And then, of course, they're also losing their immunity quicker. So that's when the booster dose comes in, which tells you, you know, you got a good response in the first place, but you're losing it quickly. So, you know, I think the idea in immunosuppressed patients is that we probably shouldn't be calling it a booster anymore. And I'd love to hear the, the panel's opinion on this. But in fact, it's really we should have done three doses to begin with, right? The studies were two doses, healthy population gave two doses. We wanted to do the studies quickly to make sure we knew whether it was safe and effective as quickly as possible. But now we're learning that maybe two doses wasn't enough in certain people and you actually need a third dose and it's not a booster. You may end up needing booster down the road or you might not, but these people need a third dose. And that's probably where I would classify IBD patients who are immunosuppressed it's seeming like they don't mount as good a response and therefore they need a third dose no matter what. Uh, I wanted to show just this prevent COVID study as well. They did, had a table with the small number of patients who were on steroids. There were only 13 patients and so they couldn't draw any major con con conclusions on such a small number, but it looked like that there was a slightly lower antibody response in people who uh, were on steroids eight weeks after their second dose. So I think that's important to remember. You remember our guidance previously that we recommend that people on steroids not go to work, stay home, stay physically distanced from people and try to avoid large crowds, especially of unvaccinated people. I think this sort of reinforces the idea that even if you've been vaccinated and you go on steroids, you have to be very, very careful. And we would recommend if possible, if you can work from home, uh, go to school at home, that would be uh, best until you're off the high dose steroids. Um, looking at third dose in other immunosuppressed populations, there really isn't that much data yet. And that's why you, had, you heard all on the news last week about how the CDC was you know, putting a damper on President Biden's recommendation that everybody get a third dose. We really don't have a lot of information on how well the third dose works, even in immunocompromised people. Uh, this, these were two, four studies, rather, two in transplant patients and two on hemodialysis. And you can see that after the second dose, they very frequently did not mount good response. And after the third dose, it was certainly better. More of them mounted a, a, a response, but it, there's still a significant group in these patients who didn't mount an adequate response. So I think the bottom line is we need more information about who might or might not mount an adequate response. That being said, I wanted to bring up sort of what's out there uh, as far as you know, recommendations for third dose or booster doses in immunocompromised people and specifically in IBD people. The first country 
that I'm aware of that made a recommendation in immunocompromised people was France. And they recommended a third dose four weeks after the second dose for severely immunocompromised people in May of 2021. And I just sort of cut and paste the recommendations from the French site, uh, the government site, saying essentially people treated with medications with strong immunosuppression, such as anti-metabolite antibodies, uh, anti-metabolites such as imuran and azathioprine, which are medicines that we use in IBD, should be getting this third dose, as well as other people who may not be on the medications listed above, but who would be in a immunosuppressed category. So that would be people pretty well, all of our IBD patients on immunosuppression medication. In Israel, uh, you're all aware that they announced the third dose very early for, for a, a wider population. But on July 11th, they did announce that people on specific immunosuppressive medications, including the meds used for IBD, would receive a third dose. They're now at the point of everybody over 30 years old is getting a third dose. And there, there is data coming out now from Israel on the general population showing that the third dose seems to be effective, but we're still waiting for the full publications. The United Kingdom on September 1st, uh, that's the Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Immunizations, announced that a third dose at least eight weeks after the second dose would be offered to immunocompromised people, and they gave a list of medications. Charlie Lee's on Twitter really summarized it very well with this sort of infographic, uh, very simplified text, but essentially it's anybody on these medications, infliximab, adalimumab, ustekinumab, and tofacidinib, not vetalizumab. Uh, prednisone or, you know, steroids, long-term or high dose, azathioprine, uh, which is, this is a higher dose than we use typically in IBD. We usually use two and a half milligrams per kilogram, six mercaptor purine, and then methotrexate, either oral or subcutaneous. We may sometimes use this dose of methotrexate as well. So the majority of IBD patients on immunosuppressive medications would qualify for a third vaccine dose in the UK. And then finally, on September 2nd, the US announced that people who are immunocompromised would qualify for a third dose, including people who are on high dose corticosteroids, so prednisone, or other drugs that suppress your immune system, including infliximab, the biologics, and others. So what's happening in Canada? Everybody's asking, and we don't have an answer right now, unfortunately. Uh, NACI actually met on September 1st about this issue and have not released their recommendations yet. So we wait for it anxiously, but what can you do? I would say write to your MPP, write to your minister of health in your province and really raise awareness in them that we at Crohn's and Colitis Canada are making these recommendations, which we'll show you in a second, and that you're worried and that you should be included as an IBD patient in that population who are considered immunosuppressed and who should get a third vaccine dose because that is our recommendation. And we, we worded the recommendation very carefully because we can't at this stage recommend to you to get a third vaccine dose because they're not available. So what we're recommending here is that you have access to the booster COVID-19 vaccines approximately 14 to 18 weeks after the second dose. And this is really aimed at policymakers to try to tell them that this is important. And in our recommendations on the website, we did show, sort of give the evidence. So if a policymaker wants to read it, you can provide the link and you can see exactly the clarity IBD study results and others. And so what we consider medications to, to suppress your immune system, systemic steroids, thiopurines, like azathioprine, 6 purine, methotrexate, and biologics. You know, the question of vetalizumab is still uncertain. We sort of said all biologics, but certainly, you know, the anti-TNF biologics, ustekinumab, and tofacidinib, as well as small molecules, should be included in that immunosuppression group. We also recommended that if you're not immunized, and I can't imagine that anybody watching this webinar at this stage is not immunized, I hope, uh, unless it was recommended by your doctor for a variety of reasons, but if you're not immunized, please, please, please get immunized. It has been well established, even in IBD patients around the world, millions have gotten two doses of COVID vaccine, and it has been well established that the benefits outweigh the risks and that it protects you in terms of your risk of death, hospitalization, ICU admission, it protects your family, and it protects any immunocompromised people in the community who may not have immunity at this stage. You do mount a response, you know, it may not last as long, but it does work. And then finally, we strongly encouraged employers like Crohn's and Colitis Canada, who I, I wanna thank 
uh, Laurie Radke, the, the president of Crohn's and Colitis Canada, for introducing a mandatory vaccine policy. We think it's very important that employers and schools uh, introduce mandatory vaccines policies because it protects you and your families, the people who are immunocompromised, who may not have a full response to the vaccine or who may have had waning response. Uh, we have our recommendations here and an info sheet that you can read on and, you know, uh, read about and all the common questions, FAQ and that sort of thing. So please go to the vaccine website and read more. As always, discuss with your healthcare provider. There may be certain situations that you may not be offered a COVID vaccine at this stage, uh, but we encourage you to, uh, to speak to your healthcare provider about that. And essentially, our guideline is get it as soon as possible. So with that, I will start by introducing our first panelist. So I'll introduce uh, Dr. Abdu Shakawi, uh, who many of you know, uh, I suspect, but uh, Abdu is an assistant professor of medicine at my university, at University of Toronto, and an infectious disease consultant and internist at University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, I should mention that Abdu is on call right now for internal medicine. So if you see him suddenly disappear, I think he's still there. Yeah, he is. Uh, if you see him suddenly disappear, it's not because he took offense to anything you asked or something you said. It's because there was an emergency on the ward. So thank you so much, Abdu, for joining us. Abdu has 20 years of experience in medicine on the front lines and now really routinely appears on various media outlets uh, as an expert in ID and COVID-19, particularly a resource lead for CTV News Canada. And I think Abdu has really made a uh, a science of medical communication when it comes to infectious diseases, particularly COVID-19. And it's such, it's a science that we don't learn in medical school. So it really is something that you've clearly practiced and a talent that you have that I think all of us should be learning, you know, in medical school and beyond because your way of communicating is absolutely found fantastic. So thank you, Abdu, for, for joining us. I, we, we all really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So we'll start with some questions that were submitted by the audience. Um, <laughs> first is sort of a bit of a downer, I guess. Uh, what do you see at the fourth wave looking like in Canada, knowing that we are in it? But what do you foresee in the coming months? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm very humbled and touched by that. And uh, a big thanks to Crohn's and Colitis Canada for inviting me um, to the rest of the panel uh, and to everyone uh, attending. Uh, the great thing about this pandemic, if we can draw any silver linings from it, is the fact that uh, we're becoming more aware, we're becoming more educated and more engaged when it comes to health literacy and learning more about protecting ourselves and our communities. So uh, this is a, an opportunity that we can ill afford to um, let us uh, miss. Um, in terms of the fourth wave in Canada, I think that uh, we are likely going to see um, something that is somewhere in between um, what we experienced in, in the second and third waves um, in terms of numbers. I know that a lot of the projections that have been doled out uh, seem rather dire and very bleak. Um, we have to remember that modeling is a very inexact science. There's a quite a range between what the most uh, dire projections might be, and, and those would signify doing everything the wrong way uh, with respect to risk mitigation uh, versus the best case scenario where you do everything optimally. And, and, and I think we can reasonably say that neither of those things is likely. Um, so we're likely going to fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and what does that mean in terms of who's going to be impacted by this and, and what scale will it represent in terms of the disruption, um, not, only to, not only to our healthcare system, but to our communities. When we talk about institutions that function like schools, um, workplaces, et cetera. Um, we can see from the trajectory in places like Alberta, for example, uh, parts of BC, uh, Saskatchewan, here in Ontario, that the numbers are climbing and they're climbing very, uh, significantly in large part because the Delta variant is a completely new animal with respect to how quickly it spreads. And unfortunately, it's also known to be more lethal. So we know that when we look at the data, 
uh, you are much more likely, if you have the Delta variant, all else being equal, to become sicker, to become hospitalized, to end up in the ICU. And that's after uh, accounting for other variables, age and, and other health status being uh, looked at. So that, I think, is the important point to be aware of. On the one hand, we've got greater overall vaccine coverage than we had ever seen in prior waves. But on the other hand, we're counterbalancing that with a variant that has really upped its game. It's much more transmissible, um, wherein you might be able to infect one person and it would take two to three days for that person to get sick or three to four days, for example, with an alpha variant in, in the second wave or the third wave. Now we're looking at maybe one person can infect several people, uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight, up to nine, and they might start showing symptoms and getting sick within two to three days. So it's a function of the rapidity of the spread as much as it is um, the aggressiveness of the variant itself that I think is going to offset the fact that we do have a significant proportion of our population vaccinated. And so who's going to be impacted? I think it's two groups in particular. It's going to be obviously those that remain unvaccinated um, largely and those that are partially vaccinated because what we do know specifically about this variant is, yeah, the vaccines still work. They're still very protective in terms of preventing us from getting very sick, ending up in hospital, ICU, or dying. But it's very much predicated on the idea of being fully vaccinated. And that means getting to that antibody level that's sustainable, whether you have an immune compromising condition or not, but especially if you've got something like Crohn's or, or UC or any other situation where we know that that antibody response is not going to be mounted as quickly and it's probably going to wane. So it's really critical that we get a fully dosed uh, situation to prevent the possibility from um, being impacted, from being infected and getting really sick. So anyone without a fully vaccinated status is who's going to really be at risk. And those are the people we're seeing right now in my ICU, in the emergency room. You know, I, I can't actually think of the last patient I saw in the past two and a half months who was seriously ill, who was fully vaccinated. And, and that's, you know, I've seen quite a few patients um, who have suffered COVID-19 over these past few months. And, and, you know, with rare exception, that's the situation. What about the people who can't be vaccinated for various reasons? And of course, now we're talking about kids under the age of 12 who at this point in time are not eligible. And I think this is going to be an interesting one uh, because there is this sort of uh, assumption out there. Um, and, and Eric, I'm very interested in what you'll be seeing and, and how you feel about this. But I think there's an assumption out there that A, kids can't be infected uh, with COVID-19 as readily. Uh, B, when they do, they're unlikely to, to uh, incur a very severe outcome from it, and C, that they're not really likely to spread it to others. And I have to say that on each of those points, I really take contention. Uh, I take issue with the veracity of those claims because I don't really think they're well-founded based on any good evidence. There's a lot of speculation out there, but they're not really based on sound evidence when it comes to testing widely. So we've got these crude, uh, you know, studies that have been done based on what are called seroprevalence, where we look at the antibody levels, you know, generically in a population of kids, and we compare it to uh, an outside of the school environment. And we say, well, if they're relatively the same, um, there's probably no additional risk. Um, and the problem is you can't really make that, that case. You also can't make the case that kids won't necessarily be vectors of this virus without doing testing regularly, sustainably. And frankly, that hasn't been done almost anywhere in the world with any degree of strict attention to good uh, science. So I think we will see kids that are unfortunately sicker. And I, see, I think we will see kids in, in hospitals and in ICU uh, more frequently than we've seen in, in any other wave. One, because they're unvaccinated and two, just based on the reality that they are go going to be congregating in institutional environments that frankly are not um, in large measure as well protected or optimized with what we know are the best risk mitigation strategies. And that means that beyond going through just masking protocols, we're talking about a really good emphasis 
on reducing class numbers and, and trying to cohort as much as possible and very practical things like making sure there's HEPA filters on buses that are gonna be crowded with kids that are sitting for maybe half an hour, 45 minutes each way to go to school uh, or ventilation systems, frankly, in the schools themselves, many of which may be 50, 60 years uh, in need of retrofitting. So I think it's naive to expect that without introducing some really significant changes in those areas, we won't see kids uh, that are going to get sick uh, and in hospital more than we've seen before. Can we expect to see the same situation we're seeing in the southern US, for example, where there's kids literally filling up ICUs in places like Texas and Louisiana? I don't think so. And I think that's going to be uh, a reflection of the fact that we have some degree, uh, a, a fairly reasonable degree of protection, obviously, from others. So from the adults and the over 12 population that is surrounding kids at home and in our community and within the school environment, that is going to provide a um, micro herd immunity pr pr protective effect, if we can call it that, but it's not sufficient. So we are going to be really in need of getting vaccines into kids, into any susceptible populations as soon as possible, along with really optimizing the risk mitigation strategies uh, from our policymakers to make sure we get through the fourth wave. Uh, we're going to see hundreds, thousands of infections per day. Um, I don't think we'll see the same overwhelming situation with respect to our ICUs, but it remains a possibility if we let our, our guard down. Um, and hopefully we won't see a resurgence of other viruses. I think that's another thing um, Eric, you and I were talking about that before we started here. We haven't even been talked about the possibility of things like flu and RSV and other respiratory viruses that have kind of disappeared the last couple of years because of such strict uh, measures from a public health guidance standpoint. Now that those have sort of loosened a lot in many areas, I think we can expect to see a comeback uh, in those. So I agree. And I, I, let's... risk really are going to be uh, the unvaccinated, I think kids in particular and anybody um, who hasn't gotten their vaccines in an optimal schedule. Yeah, and I would just want to put in a plug for the flu shot, which is coming in a couple of months. You know, we've shown in IBD patients, at least in children with IBD, that it is safe. It doesn't cause a flare-up of IBD. And in fact, kids visited their doctors less often for IBD reasons in the years that they got their flu shot compared to the years that they didn't. That was an Ontario study that we put out a few years ago. We think that viruses can flare up IBD. So it's possible that vaccines are actually preventing you from getting the virus and then preventing you from getting the flare. So please do get your flu shot this year. I think it's particularly important to take a burden off of uh, the healthcare system. Now, Abdu, just uh, coming back to a point about kids, uh, any information about COVID vaccines in pediatrics in children under 12? Yeah, so I think this one is a little bit tricky. Um, when we had looked at where we were in early 2021, I think there was a fair amount of, opt of optimism that frankly, we'd have good data by early summer and that if all went well, uh, we could actually see a, a vast range of uh, kids under the age of 12 being uh, vaccinated even before starting school, um, never mind into the fall uh, where we are now, where we haven't seen anyone. And I think you'll touch on this at some point, but. Uh, Frankly, I think the biggest concern and the, the, the biggest impediment has been the issue of myocarditis that has surfaced in younger patients in general, uh, between the ages of 13 and 30 in particular. And I think there's been a great deal of caution being exercised uh, by Pfizer and Moderna because largely those have been uh, the drivers of research in, in younger age groups that we don't wanna see that signal A duplicated in kids under the age of 12, and we certainly don't wanna see one that's any worse. I think that um, it's still very plausible and very likely that we will get data at some point over the next couple of months. And I'm still hopeful and optimistic that we will get clearance and approval before the end of 2021. Is it going to be in time to, I think, fully protect our kids and keep schools as safe as possible? Uh, probably not, which I think lends itself to the importance of prioritizing every other risk mitigation strategy. But I think it's very likely that in the first quarter of 2021, we could envision um, a vast range of, of kids under the age of 12 being vaccinated with one or both of Pfizer and Moderna.
Yeah, and I did want to, I mean, this was planned for a bit later in the uh, webinar, but since you brought up this issue of myocarditis and people may remember that uh, when we presented back in April, there was this concern about myocarditis in young males, sort of teenage, uh, early 20s males. And there was a question of whether the benefits of taking the vaccine in that age group, especially in males, outweighed the risk. Since then, I think the issue has become more clear in teenagers and young adults, males. This is uh, from, I'll just zoom in a little bit, sorry, uh, from the ASIP meeting on August 30th. And you can very clearly see that the benefits far outweigh the risk. So yes, it is still an issue in males, the myocarditis risk, but the reduction in the rate of hospitalizations and of ICU admissions, even in young males, 16 to 17 year olds, far outweighs the risk of it. Looking at it a different way, so this is again, risk benefit in young males of the vaccine compared to the myocarditis risk in red. And then these are the raw numbers, right? I don't think we can argue with the raw numbers that you know this is the risk of myocarditis in the various young age groups, males and females. And this is the number of ICU admissions that it prevented if you got the COVID vaccine. And we're talking about the Pfizer, uh, BioNTech vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, which are, you know, the same risk, same benefits. So I, I don't think anymore that there's a question in young males that we should be giving it uh, as well as in. So I think somebody, an audience had asked a question about, you know, a 17 year old on methotrexate and my response would be absolutely get it. Yeah, I just want to put, point out and piggyback on that. The, the idea that, I mean, I've seen um, several cases of, of uh, vaccine-induced myocarditis uh, right here in this hospital, many, you know, sort of bordering on, on pediatric in terms of their age, you know, around 18, maybe 17 uh, years of age. And I can tell you that with no exceptions, actually, uh, they've all done remarkably well. It has basically been a short course of some form of, of immunomodulatory therapy and monitoring uh, uh, ultrasounds, echoes, et cetera, uh, compared to uh, quite a few patients that I've seen who've had COVID-19 induced myocarditis, many of whom are a year past their initial infection who have not recovered. They've got permanent cardiac issues uh, and they, they, they can't function anywhere near the same level that they did a year ago. So I think it highlights the truth, which is in the vast majority of cases, uh, the disease and the virus is far, far more damaging and far, far more problematic. Uh, than the vaccine itself, even when they produce a similar syndrome. Absolutely. I just wanted to get your um, perspective on this whole concept of decoupling, this whole kind of public policy process where cases are climbing, but vaccines are going to prevent hospitalization. So then we can kind of pull back on, on public health measures um, to get your thoughts on, on that and, and where things are going in the future. Yeah, I think that uh, that whole concept has become a little bit problematic. And I think the reason for that is one, it's the optics that generate a sense of complacency and this idea that we're dealing with a quote unquote case-demic, uh, which was a term that was rampantly popularized by those who really denied the seriousness of this whole virus and the pandemic to begin with. And while we certainly do want to be cognizant of the fact that, yeah, it is at the end of the day, uh, most important to prevent serious illness and to prevent hospitalization and ICU admissions and death. What we're negating here is the understanding that the number of cases that continues to evolve is not going to remain a benign entity uh, into perpetuity. At some point, uh, the simple vast number of cases is going to lead to complications and that may be the breakthrough cases that we talk about. Not every vaccine is going to be 100% protective, even under the best of circumstances, and certainly not with anyone who's immunosuppressed or immune compromised. And the other thing that I don't think has really been emphasized anywhere near enough is the issue of long COVID. And that's something that doesn't get anywhere near enough attention. A lot of those patients don't end up getting hospitalized because they're not quite deathly ill enough to warrant that. But I can tell you firsthand, it's tragic what they're experiencing in terms of their functionality. And they come to clinic regularly and they've got to go through all kinds of different rehab programs and um, they're off work and it's debility and, and morbidity, uh, which is as much a problem as actual mortality. And that's a signal that I don't think people 
are aware of. Somewhere in that vast number of cases of people that don't show up filling up our emergency rooms is someone's life that has been irrevocably changed. And it's very tragic. It's very personally disheartening when I see those patients uh, in clinic and I hear their stories and I know that it was a preventable situation. If we had just held on a little bit more tightly, we've been a bit more prudent about you know, low hanging fruit, like masking, for example, or being, I think, judicious and intelligent about designing where activities should happen, optimizing the outdoors, improving ventilation standards. I mean, we can make infrastructural changes that allow people to live their lives in a healthy way, in a productive way, without undermining our total sense of freedom and feeling alienated. But unfortunately, we've had this very polarizing and pendulous sort of tendency to say, no, we're going to completely shut everything down and it's going to be a blunt instrument and you're harming, uh, you know, with a lot of collateral damage at the same time as helping um, or you're opening the floodgates like we did in Alberta. And you say, well, we've just closed the book on this and we all know how that's turning out right now. So we've got to find that middle ground. And I think we have to implore at every level within our public health community and at the policymaking level to try and be a little bit more judicious a bit more evidence-based and more than anything, proactive and patient. Because every time we've made a mistake and we've ended up getting hit in the head with it, it's because we've been reactive and we've been behind uh, the virus rather than in front of it. What's your sense, Abdu, uh, just I guess last question for you before we bring in Deepak, but what's your sense for what's driving this hesitancy? And you can say vaccine hesitancy, but also masking hesitancy. What do you sense when you speak to people? Yeah, it's a really great question. And it's an interesting one, because frankly, it's one that I think um, was very enlightening for me. Uh, I think there's this prevailing perception out there that people who at this point in time haven't been vaccinated are simply bound and determined uh, to act in a way that is not in keeping with caring about others. And I think that's a really that oversimplification of things. There's certainly a contingent of people out there who no matter what you say or how hard you try to engage, uh, I think they're gonna be very fixed and resolute and can be grounded in a whole host of other value systems and ideologies that are probably not going to be changeable. But I think we need to open our eyes to the possibility that not everybody is like that. And I can tell you even today here in my clinic, a few hours ago, I saw a gentleman who had recovered from a serious uh, brain infection and he hadn't had his first dose. And it wasn't a function of not caring. I think it was a function of him not understanding, number one, that he still needed it. um, And number two, uh, that he can get it uh, after having his infection resolved. Uh, There's still a little bit of a lack of health literacy in many areas. There's still some cultural issues that I think prevent uh, parts of our community from being as easily engaged. So I think that point of outreach and that point of wanting to um, communicate and to bridge the gap, uh, not thinking that it's due to enmity, acrimony or anything else, but maybe due to still a lack of access and a lack of literacy is worth looking into. Um, And I think we will be able to entice more and more people. It's a monumental challenge. We need every part of that 20% of our community that really needs to be Uh, vaccinated uh, on board if we can. But I just want to caution, I think there's just so much polarizing belief out there right now. Uh, Let's try and open our minds and our hearts a little bit and and win people over that way, rather than uh, doing it from the trenches and and firing shots at each other, because I don't think that's going to help. Yeah, and I think education is such an important part, and particularly for this audience who, you know, as you listen to Eric's presentation, CC's recommendations, there's a group of people who are, are potentially susceptible to COVID in, in different ways in the general population. And I think if you in the audience, one thing that, that you can do, I, I get like Eric said, I imagine most of you are vaccinated, but if you do know people who are not, you, you can tell you can you can tell them your story. You can tell them why it's so important for you and for others like you who might be a little bit more susceptible, why it's so important for that, that individual who is hasn't gotten vaccinated and 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 isn't why they should. Um, and, and maybe this is a, a good point to also pivot to bring in Dr. Paracald uh, Deepak as well. I and mean, we've been focused a lot about kind of the general um, impacts of um, COVID-19 um, 
but I, I wanted to bring in um, Deepak to talk more about kind of the implications specific to the IBD community. And, and uh, Dr. Parakal Deepak is an assistant professor of medicine, uh, clinical investigator in the IBD Center in the division of GI uh, at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. He is an internationally renowned um, IBD specialist, clinical clinician and clinical researcher. Uh, and over this past year has done tremendous work in trying to explore the impact of having inflammatory bowel disease and being on immunosuppressive therapies and what that means for you in the context of getting COVID-19. And he hasn't done this in isolation to just IBD, but has actually collaborated with a multidisciplinary team of rheumatologists and other specialists looking at a series of chronic immunity diseases. Um, and we're very excited to have you here to be able to talk to um, us about your experiences and some of the research that you've published. And, and I guess kind of the, the question we have for you is, you know, what, what is kind of the most latest data that we have on the effectiveness of the vaccine in patients with inflammatory bowel disease? Can I, can I sorry, I humbly apologize uh, to, to interject. I just wanted to make one last point. Thank you so much, uh, Deepak and Gil. Before I forget one really critical point, uh, when I was talking about long COVID, uh, th there has been a suspicion for a long period of time that um, if you have a vaccination, that you will be at lesser risk for long COVID compared to someone who has not been vaccinated, but we haven't had data. We now have that data. So it's emerging and it's really positive and promising that if you get the vaccine, it's not just much more likely to prevent you from getting very sick. It's also more likely to prevent long COVID. So it's really, really, really important. That was on my I mind. Really apologize. I I'm no, sorry. I was going to uh, ask. Deepak, thank you so much for for letting me interject. So I was going to uh, ask, and so I assume there was there. there was still no data. So I'm glad to hear that there is some data. That's great. Sorry. Go ahead, Deepak. Yeah, I was going to say uh, thanks, Gil, for uh, having me here. Uh, I was going to make two points before uh, I guess um, I show some of the data. One was that it is, you know, in a sense, strange to have somebody from the United States talk to Canadians about vaccines. You know, since um, Eric's slide showed that you guys are actually ahead of us. And of course, the uh, second point I was going to make was that uh, it's going to be a hard act to follow uh, Dr. Sharkavi in terms of uh, the communication skills. So hopefully I can make up some of that through the slides. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, let me see if I can share. Uh, are you guys seeing the screen? Or my screen? Okay. Yeah, we do. So, yep. So I think I can, uh, I'm going to just jump in directly sort of uh, to Gil's first question on sort of the, some of the data, including ours from current studies of vaccine effectiveness in um, IMIDs, which actually sort of a fancy term that stands for immune mediated inflammatory diseases. Uh, this is one of the terms used among many others, which is sort of a broad term that includes IBD and many other autoimmune and auto inflammatory conditions. Uh, some of which we managed to study together and uh, others have studied also. So I start with uh, data from our study, which was done at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, along with some collaborators from University of California at San Francisco. This was called the COVID-19 vaccine responsiveness in patients with autoimmune diseases or uh, Coveripad. So this was published recently uh, and uh, this was work done uh, to a large part also uh, by my co uh, principal investigator, Dr. Alfred Kim, who's from rheumatology at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, as you can see in the, um, the top right-hand corner of the screen and uh, looks uh, and you know looks much better than me too and uh, dresses better. Uh, so um, this is a prospective cohort study uh, where patients were studied after two doses of the mRNA vaccine at the time of this first manuscript. Now, I will say that we have since grown this cohort to also include a small number of patients who've had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, although I'm not presenting any data on that subgroup because this is really data from our first paper of patients who all had received the mRNA vaccine, two doses for the most part Pfizer, which was sort of the initial part. And also because a lot of people we recruited initially, both patients and controls, were actually from our clinics and also actually 
for a large part working in our health system uh, as healthcare professionals and similar positions within the healthcare system. We assess them about two weeks before and about 20 days after the second dose of the vaccine. We had about 133 patients 50, and about 53 controls. And in this part of the study, we measured uh, antibodies against a spike protein, which again has been mentioned several times before on this webinar, and I'm sure you're fairly now sort of aware of. And also this other type of antibody, which is now also being measured called the neutralizing antibody titer. I'll just explain that for a second. So the idea is that uh, in the lab, uh, especially like in our case, in, our, in one of our virology collaborators lab, they have taken a fairly common virus called the vesicular stomatitis virus uh, or VSV and then pseudotype that at this point in this study to mirror the normal variant. And uh, our collaborators have subsequently also made progress to pseudotype it to the Delta variant. Uh, some of that would be data that we would present in our second manuscript and is emerging. But at the time of this paper, this was the regular variant. Um, so that is sort of the ability of the serum of the patient to neutralize this pseudotyped virus. Sort of, you can call it sort of a lab uh, pseudo variant that resembles a common variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2 at the time of this manuscript. About 31% of the patients had IBD, 28% had rheumatoid arthritis. So the key results here, broadly and numerically, uh, patients who were on various immunosuppressive medications called here by the term CID, which is chronic inflammatory diseases in our study. They did have numerically uh, lower responses to the two doses of the mRNA vaccine. This was also shown for the neutralizing antibody titers. Now, since these were relatively small numbers, that's why we did not necessarily do statistical analysis looking at things like p-values and such but th these were numerically lower. Um, on the far right sort of is a sort of a busy figure, but that really shows the various different medications that we studied in, in our manuscript and also shows the fact that only about 43% um, of our patients were on monotherapy. The rest of them were on various different combinations. And we've tried to show, the, show it through this uh, figure, which is called an upset plot where these sort of black dots represent actual patients on a medication. And when you have uh, two dots joined by a line, that's a patient who's on two different medications at the same time, which is, as you probably know, fairly common in treating IBD and other autoimmune diseases. So we've tried to sort of capture that sense of the various medications people are on through this figure. Um, trying to make the point that often it's not one medication, but maybe a, a effect of two medications on the response to the vaccine. So one of the key findings from our study, uh, which I think uh, Eric has uh, mentioned before, has been shown in the Prevent COVID study also, is the idea that being on steroids, mainly we studied prednisone, we did not study uh, gut release mechanisms such as butyrsenide or eucerus. We focused on prednisone and he, we here do show that patients on prednisone had numerically lower antibody titers. Um, we, so th this is sort of called a box plot where you have sort of the lines in between show sort of the median, uh, median titers on these patients. And as you can see here, if you compare it to the immunocompetent patients, those on prednisone had numerically lower titers for both anti-spike protein antibodies as well as neutralizing antibodies. And again, here we show the fact that while uh, they were on prednisone, the, the reality was that most of these patients were on a combination of prednisone and a second medication. So uh, the zero conversion on patient who was on prednisone in our study was about 65% uh, after vaccination compared to the rest of the cohort not on prednisone at the time of vaccination, where it was about 92%. Uh, we also had data from TNF-alpha inhibitors. About uh, 39 patients uh, were on TNF-alpha inhibitors at the time of the first manuscript. 
And of this, about 18, we were also able to capture their neutralizing antibody. Um, in our study, I would say at the time of the first manuscript, we do, the patients on TNF-alpha inhibitors did have lower titers if you look at the immunocompetent controls, which is always to the sort of the far left in each figure. But the levels were somewhat similar to those not, an, not on an anti-TNF. The other category we had were patients on Janus kinase inhibitors, um, common ones used in IBD. Right now, that's a, uh, that's approved. Uh, again, I'm so I apologize if I'm not aware of the Canadian uh, uh, approval process, but uh, in the US, FDA approved in IBD. The only one right now available is tofacitinib, uh, but there are others sort of in phase three and may be available in a not too distant future. So Janus kinase inhibitors here looked at as a class effect. So they are being used here across various autoimmune diseases. Um, you can see that unlike the anti-TNFs, you can see somewhat of a more clearer drop, uh, again, numerically lower. We did not do tests for significance because of the low numbers, because we only had 11 patients at the time of the first manuscript on a Janus kinase inhibitor, but you do sort of see a lower antibody titer in patients on Janus kinase inhibitors and somewhat similar data with the neutralizing antibodies. So that's sort of data from uh, Coveripad. So the key takeaways from Coveripad specific to IBD was uh, the effect of steroids and certainly a uh, sort of a hint of an effect of Janus kinase inhibitors uh, with, the, with the small sample size that we have. Um, the Clarity IBD, I'm going to sort of somewhat skip over this because I think Eric already showed these slides here. The main takeaway from Clarity, this initial manuscript, not the new one that's in preprint, but the initial manuscript was that really you need two doses uh, to have an effective uh, response uh, to the vaccines, you, whether you're talking of infliximab or vedulizumab. But certainly if you had a prior infection and then had a dose that could, that in effect may be acting like a booster here. Um, and then there's clearly an effect of immunomodulators in this cohort. Um, the other uh, relevant data they did show in the first manuscript was the impact of age um, and also uh, potentially an impact of interestingly smoking uh, on the responses, uh, which again, I have to say the smoking part, I, I'm not sure has been necessarily replicated in other cohorts, but again, certainly an interesting, uh, impactful variable here. Uh, prevent COVID, again, I'm gonna skip over this because I think Eric already showed these slides. Um, I think the key take home message from prevent COVID as Eric highlighted was similar to our study. They did show a potential impact of steroids um, on the response to the vaccine. In this study, they looked at anti-spike antibody titers. Uh, they did not look at neutralizing antibodies, uh, unlike in our study. So in our study, we also showed there was an impact on neutralizing antibody titers uh, with steroid exposure at the time of vaccination. Uh, the other thing I forgot to mention and which honestly did not make the final manuscript, uh, but it's there in a preprint, is that uh, in the small number of patients on prednisone that we had about 11, we did not necessarily see a dose response relationship. Um, and again, this may be a result of the small sample size and something we'll need to clarify further. Um, so it's sort of skipping over some of this, I think our data I did want to share uh, is a recent systematic review and meta-analysis that I was a part of uh, that looked at about across all the literature that exists at the time of our search, uh, which was probably, I, I would probably say mid-August uh, when we searched this. We found about 25, pay, uh, 25 studies that involved uh, any kind of usage of immunosuppression in patients with various uh, immune-mediated inflammatory diseases and the worst vaccine effectiveness data available. So that led to about 25 studies. And uh, the first figure, again, this is what's called as a forest plot, uh, interestingly, which sort of, you know, you could almost say stands for the busyness of all of this, uh, looks like a forest in a way. But the key message I wanted to sort of highlight here, uh, shown by the so, sort of the uh, highlight box here is the fact that patients with IBD, uh, when you pool all the 25 studies together, remarkably had a fairly good 
uh, zero conversion across the studies. Around 95% of the patients zero converted, which actually looks uh, or is comp is uh, com comparable in a good way compared to some of the patients with other autoimmune diseases. If you look at the fact that some of the ones on top, rheumatoid arthritis, it's about 80%. Um, so SLE around 90%. So patients with IBD did seem to do better. And that may also be because of the, some of the differences in the kind of medications we use compared to uh, in IBD compared to the drugs used in other conditions. Um, then going to some of the questions asked in the chat box, um, the impact of steroids does seem to be there when you look at the data summed up together in this uh, sort of data synthesis approach that we did in this paper. So the zero conversion of if on steroids at the time of vaccination was about 78%. Um, the other key data points is that Janus kinase inhibitors, it was slightly higher, but was about 84%. And then uh, we looked at infliximab somewhat separately from sort of a class effect of anti-TNF, mainly because of some of the studies that had focused on infliximab as a drug of interest, and that was around 89%. But if you look down right below that, anti-integrins was actually, they, the patients did quite well. It was about 95%. We did not have enough data to look at uh, uh, Stellara or Ustekinumab. That's why that's not there in this forest plot. The other thing we also looked at was uh, comparing patients who were on TNF monotherapy compared to an anti-TNF with uh, some kind of an immunomodulator. And anti-TNF monotherapy patients did have a 60% higher likelihood of zero conversion compared to those on combination. But again, this is somewhat of a comparison. While most studies would show that even patients on combination therapy did have a reasonably good rate of zero conversion. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, Gil, stop me anytime you, you'd like, or if you'd like me to kind of go ahead with the uh, uh, adverse events, I'm happy to do it. How do you feel? Well, if you wanted to to summarize um, the risk in IBD patients, because I think I think you, you did a brilliant job of showing how effective these vaccines are um, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and comparing them to other um, immune mediated diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, breaking them up by by drug, and I think it was very highly appreciated. And, and again, the the, 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 those are effects looking at after two doses of the, of the vaccine. And right. obviously the flip side of that is, are there any risks to, to people with IBD if they get a vaccine, particularly if we start looking at thinking about things like getting third doses, multiple exposures. So are there any safety signals that, that people should be concerned about? Sure. Uh, and again, I'm happy to sort of show you a couple of studies that I'm aware of uh, that have looked at uh, some of the safety concerns uh, with vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 in patients with IBD. The first one comes from a group uh, out of Cedars-Sinai uh, in Los Angeles uh, of a uh, study called the uh, uh, Corail IBD or how you pronounce that. Um, this at the time of the first publication had about 246 patients uh, where they had assessed adverse events after at least one dose of an mRNA vaccine. Of this, about 57% had the uh, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech Bi vaccine and about 43% had the Moderna vaccine. Uh, nine patients had a prior COVID infection and then 50 patients were not on any immune modifying therapies as they had in their manuscript, which included patients on mesalamine, but really anything beyond that was considered as an immune modifying therapy. And they looked at uh, adverse events after dose one or D1 and then after dose two or D2. Um, the overall frequency was about 39% after dose one in the cohort and 62% after dose two. Uh, most of the common side effects really were local, uh, such as injection site reaction uh, in about half the patients. About 45% of the patients had a more systemic reaction, more com most common being fatigue. Uh, which is also commonly reported. Um, now, some of the interesting things from this study uh, were that, um, so, so this is sort of a slightly busy in a sense, but to sort of walk you through this, what this really shows is the various different adverse events, either local or systemic after dose one and dose two. And then further on, purple are all the patients who are on 
no immune modifying therapy and green are all the patients on an immune modifying therapy again no no immune modifying therapy means no medication or mesalamine or 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 sulfasalazine um immune modifying therapy is really everything else including steroids and now within each color a darker color indicates a more severe form of adverse event so really if you look across this even without any fancy statistics you can sort of see that there are sort of taller blocks on patients on no immune modifying therapy and slightly shorter blocks on patients on immune modifying therapy in other words more adverse events both local and systemic in patients who are on no immune modifying therapy um what's also uh, interesting further in this uh, study was that specifically looking with more detailed statistical approach after the second dose and adverse events they showed that younger patients had more adverse events and as the age of the patient increased there were less adverse events and as what's obvious here patients who were on immune modifying therapies actually had less uh, reported adverse event in terms of just the frequency of adverse events um, this was sort of the take away from this paper now sort of to take this one step further uh, and this is data that is actually currently under review from our group or the coveripad group as you had seen earlier from the immunogenicity data as a sort of a follow up and with a larger cohort of 441 participants Uh, which includes the patients and the controls we tried to look at sort of the adver reported adverse events and was there any kind of a relationship with the response to the vaccine because again this was something i think i've commonly faced as a question from uh, our patients whether you know how you reacted to the vaccine could that tell you something about um you know sort of a response in actual measured antibody titers so what this is looking uh, when it, so along the x axis you have two groups you have one group to the left that is the chronic inflammatory diseases or patients with autoimmune disease on various immune modifying therapies on the right you have the healthy or the immunocompetent controls along the y axis you have sort of the predicted titer uh, which was measured in the study and this is for the anti spike antibodies uh, not the neutralizing antibody titers because we did not really have neutralizing antibody titer across the large uh, majority of the cohort at the time of this analysis so what this really showed uh, as you can sort of almost see intuitively is that as the number of symptoms uh, in terms of adverse event symptoms reported after the second dose increased there seemed to be sort of a increase or an association with a greater antibody uh, response to the vaccine so that's really what sort of this figure shows um and then uh, sort of taking this a step further again with a more complicated statistical analysis what i would really concentrate on is really within this sort of box that shows that increase uh, severity of adverse events uh, after the first dose or increase number of symptoms after the second dose and also certain kinds of symptoms such as local site pain uh, a generalized symptoms such as fever or fatigue it seem to have a, a relationship with increased likely increase in uh, antibody response in the study now uh, sort of a uh, you know a, a um, astute statistician uh, such as eric and uh, gil would say that these uh, confidence intervals are somewhat wide so i will say that you know the, the data is what it shows but again perhaps because of the sample size we have wide confidence intervals so in in short this is the data but i would say probably the the strength of the data is somewhat low and hopefully we can sort of replicate that with larger numbers either within our cohort or combining other cohorts so i think that's sort of the the data with adverse events that we have so far in ibd yeah and that kind of brings us to to the slide right here which is the role of a third dose or a booster shot and and you know we we spent a lot of this webinar discussing this and we're very curious to get your perspective of what's happening in the US like your thoughts overall based on on your knowledge sure. of the of the work but also what's the practice happening in in the United States right now with regards to more than two doses sure 
Yeah, so I think, uh, and uh, Eric, I mean, and again, I didn't put in the slide from the FDA recommendation because um, uh, I was aware that uh, Eric was going to show that. And as, as if you recall the FDA slide, it it is fairly broad in terms of uh, what it recommend, what they recommend uh, that we do in our discussion with our IBD patient, because they've really said any patients on prednisone greater than 20 milligrams, I believe, and any immune modifying therapy. Um, now the prednisone question, I would probably say currently it's unresolved, definitely in our small sample size and the prevent COVID study, you will, you would say th there's a suggestion that there's a, um, there's a hint of uh, hint in the data that patients on prednisone at the time of their vaccination, it does seem to impact their response to the vaccine. Um, again, it was not there in our final manuscript, but it's there in a preprint that we failed to show a dose response relationship that patients on a lower dose of prednisone at the time of vaccination were doing okay compared to those on a high dose. So I think given that uncertainty, my recommendations to my patients are really to consider any IBD patient for that matter, who's not on, uh, who's, uh, who's on any kind of a medication beyond a mesalamine, I would probably strongly consider, you know, recommend doing a booster at this point. Um, I know the recommendation on vedolizumab somewhat varies based on the country recommendations across the different countries. Um, I will say that even that, I, f I would say, I'm not sure we know enough because I think um, Eric uh, showed us the DK of antibody data, which is happening even in patients with vedolizumab. Right, so that I think causes me sort of pause to say that do we really know enough about even virulizumab and the DK on it to strongly say that someone on virulizumab does not need to get a booster. So I think at this point, I would rather take a more conservative position given that vaccines are widely available that anyone who has IBD who is on anything more than mesalamine probably uh, ought to get a booster. Um, I think, you know, again, in patients who have IBD who are on, let's say, no medication or on just mesalamine, I think that may be a more detailed conversation if they happen to be, let's say, over, over the age of 60 or 65, because that may be by itself an independent risk factor for uh, worse outcomes as just driven by their comorbidities or by the age. So I think that again needs to be, you know, thought of as a separate conversation there. Uh, but I, I, but I think that's sort of my broad take on this. And, and Erica, as we're getting close to the end of the presentation, I, I wouldn't mind kind of circling back to some of the comments you made earlier about the kind of disconnect between what we're recommending, the the type of data that we showed over the past hour and a half, and and the fact that you know different provincial governments essentially for the most part are, uh, are not including people with IBD who are on drugs like anti-TNF therapy in terms of having access to booster shots. And I just wanted to get kind of, I think you said it quite nicely and eloquently earlier, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate, how do we square that peg? Yeah, so, um, and I think people in the chat really had great, some great suggestions is they, you know, they asked for some sort of letter, right? To send to their uh, MPP, their MLS, ML, MLA, sorry, uh, their MNA, uh, to really try to reinforce that this is an issue and that Crohn's and Colitis Canada is recommending it, but the, the, you know, the policymakers aren't necessarily listening. And Crohn's and Colitis Canada will put a letter out uh, early next week, probably Tuesday, uh, on their writing platform. I guess there's a letter writing platform that they have on the website where you can submit your name and your postal code, and the letter will actually go directly to your member of parliament. Uh, your provincial member of parliament and so that'll be out there look for it in the um in an email for the people who are attending this webinar live as well as in the talk about guts newsletter which will be out tuesday there'll be a link there to actually advocate for yourselves right i think that's the key is you know we want to try to get people to listen uh those letters also go to the ministry of health the minister of health and the premier of the province as well so hopefully that will help you know, I think in the meantime, we, people talked about Alberta and Quebec offering uh, third doses now. Quebec, certainly I know if you are an IBD patient on an immunosuppressing medication, I believe you can get your third dose in Quebec. So what we've recommended based on the Clarity IBD study, and Deepak, maybe you can confirm this is what you would recommend as well, is we recommend about 14 to 18 weeks out. That's the time period where it seems to be 
really waning, and that's the time period where the third dose would be most effective. Is that what you're telling your patients, Deepak? I would say so. I, I would broadly agree on that uh, with the caveat that, again, you know, it's one study. I think, as you mentioned, it's in preprint, uh, still needs peer review. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think as scientists, we always say we need more data, but I mean, it's also balanced against the need for real time decision making. Because, I mean, we are also among groups uh, that are looking at the rate of antibody decay as sort of some of the next steps in the analysis, trying to sort of get answers to this question of when do you sort of uh, do the booster really? Uh, but I think uh, driven by data, that's definitely one good answer for the moment would be about 14 to 18 weeks out. Yeah. And then Gil, I think in Alberta, IBD patients do not qualify for that third dose, even though they've released a third dose for some people. Yeah, if you look at the Alberta Health Services policy, um, there, there is a line for individuals who are immunosuppressed, but they're very specific about the drugs and the drugs are, are essentially not the ones that we, we use to treat IBD, like, like B cell depleting drugs, like rituximab and stuff like that, but not, not specific to IBD therapies. And, and the one caveat to, to this whole conversation that I do want to express to the audience is while there's been studies about third doses in the general population, there have been studies of third doses in special populations who are immunocompromised, like transplant populations, uh, people with cancers who have who are getting active treatments. Um, we don't have that data specifically for people with IBD. Uh, that, that is being studied now, and, and I'm expect a webinar in the future that that data will will come out, but but that that is the, the, that is a caveat. There is a, a level of unknown based on the lack of, of data. And so a lot of this is us extrapolating from what we do know and extrapolating from other populations that are not inflammatory bowel disease patients. Uh, and so those are important caveats to consider when, when discussions, and in part were the reasons why um, governments haven't come through yet and said, yeah, we, we recommend you know unequivocally that we should be doing this. And, and, and again, just so people understand, why there is this uh, kind of disconnect between um, what we what we think we should do and the data that we have to really know that that is the right thing to do. That's great. And any thoughts, uh, Deepak, about should we be measuring antibodies in people with IBD routinely? Yeah, um, it's a tough question. Um, so I, I think I. Uh, so I think the official recommendation from in the US from CDC and others is not to do that. Um, I think reasons behind that, uh, if I have to elaborate one, I think as you've already pointed out, or I, I, I'm not sure one of the panelists pointed out the fact that we have all this data and levels, but really almost every one of them has used a different assay. So uh, in a sense, it's almost akin to um, at least the issues we have in the US with therapeutic drug monitoring in IBD that you it's very hard to make sense of one level versus the other. So I'm hopeful that at some point, something like that actually gets done to you know, answer that question, number one. Um, number two, um, I think there is data showing that yes, there's a good correlation between anti-spike antibodies and neutralizing antibodies, because that's something I was talking about, neutralizing antibodies. Um, and, and of course, I think you also showed that in uh, Clarity, there's good uh, correlation between anti-spike antibodies and T-cell responses. But I think the question is, uh, but the thing is that this is all sort of emerging science. Um, now, an interesting paper that I'm sure you've also read is uh, came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, maybe I think a month or two ago from Israel, where they looked at uh, healthcare workers who had breakthrough infection. And that was a very neat study that looked at anti-spike antibodies, neutralizing antibodies and uh, the association with breakthrough infection. Uh, and everybody there has been immunized with Pfizer, two doses. So what they showed in, in that was that uh, there was a stronger correlation between the likelihood of breakthrough infection and lower neutralizing antibody more so than lower anti-spike antibodies. What was also interesting in that is that, uh, and they have sort of measured these antibodies serially over time in that population. And what they showed was sort of in many ways, the peak neutralizing antibody, maybe a month out from the second dose, 
actually predicted the likelihood of breakthrough infection rather than the neutralizing antibody that was measured just a week before they were infected. So that's the other question here, I think, which leads to confusion. One is a different kind of assay. Second is what time point antibody titers really are the best answer to the likelihood of a breakthrough infection? Because right, we are really trying to answer that question here now, because we are not, I think, it's acknowledged that there's no 100% protection uh, with any vaccine. So it's really about preventing breakthrough infection and more importantly, preventing severe COVID. So I yeah, think that's, those that's exactly, sort of, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the recommendation in, from Canadian health authorities is not to use these tests routinely. Like right now, I think they're for research purposes and you know maybe they give researchers some additional information, but for patients, you know, for people, humans, it, it's sort of, it, we're not sure what to make of it. So. Uh, we don't recommend it routinely for our patients. Thank you for that. Okay, so I think you know we've we're at uh, seven forty. We want to give people some time for dinner before the debates. We have we're in the middle of a prime minister or a, a national federal election here in Canada. Deep back in case you weren't aware, so the national debates um, are at eight thirty, I believe. So let's give some people some time for dinner, and uh, then you can watch the debates. I want to remind everybody that the, all the information provided here are on the coronavirusplatus.ca website. Uh, you can see the links there, both for the vaccine information, as well as for the videos and past webinars, uh, all, also available on YouTube. And please let us know. Please provide feedback. Uh, you can provide feedback on Twitter, but of course, you only provide positive feedback on Twitter, not on not no negative feedback on Twitter. But otherwise, there's going to be a survey sent out to you right after uh, this webinar. Please take the 60 seconds and provide the feedback. Uh, I want to very specifically thank this time frontline healthcare workers. Um, I think a lot of us were disheartened last week. Uh, very sad to see the protests in front of hospitals, uh, to see patients being delayed getting into hospitals, many of whom are immunocompromised like you, uh, to see ambulances being delayed. And so I can't speak highly enough of the healthcare workers who have had a horrific 18 months and are really doing their best to help you and all patients uh, in Canada get better and deal with this pandemic so thank you on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Canada you know, community, patient population, and our staff. Uh, if you want to donate to Crohn's and Colitis Canada, because you know, these webinars do take some staff time, we're trying to raise funds to try to continue this education, and we will continue these educational webinars. But if you want to express your appreciation beyond some pos positive words on Twitter, which is fine, we like that, but please do consider donating at text 2222, tw sorry, 2222. Uh, text cure to that number to donate $25. We would really greatly appreciate it. And please do follow us on uh, social. All the social accounts are Get Gutsy Canada. And we look forward to seeing you again in October, the date to be determined, but you will get an email with the next uh, webinar topic and speakers. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Deepak, with all of the information that you provided. Thank you to Dr. Sharkawi as well, who unfortunately had to leave a bit early because he was on call. But we really appreciate both of you and all the time that you spent preparing for this webinar and answering people's questions. Thank you so much. And thank you to you, the audience, and we'll see you next month. Stay safe, please. Thanks, Gil. Thanks, Eric. And thank you to the audience uh, for all the wonderful questions. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.